so this has been a year unlike uh, unlike any other. Uh, I've not I don't recall in my career a time where the market was up twenty percent or so, and it's felt this hard. Uh, and I think that's just a reflection of the ups and downs that the economies had, the geopolitics of the world, the social uh, pressures that people are feeling. <clears throat> I think those are all the things that are weighing on the on the system right now. But I think you could make a case for uh, a very positive 24 and some challenges in 24. Uh, and I think the issues start with the big picture problems that we've talked about. <clears throat> Excuse me. Dayton is actually uh, uh, going away and the the uh, decline of globalization, the reversal of globalization, uh, starting with Trump trade wars and the like and continuing through, uh, or creating some real challenges for how businesses operate, how countries operate, and uh, how we all fit together. So I think that's one big issue. Further adding to that is the deglobalization that's gone on and the changing terms of global trade that are driving uh, new relationships. And I think we're dealing with some of the inflationary pressures, <clears throat> excuse me, and some of the other challenges coming out of that. We have a worsening demographic problem around the world. Decarbonization isn't going the way we thought. Debt is at a record level around the world and starting to crowd out uh, spending. And that is added, being uh, further added to by the worsening domestic strains and social unrest that's occurring and the demands of the population for leaders to deliver more is, uh, is a real challenge. So. If you're leading a country or a company, these are all the things you have to keep in mind and think about. How do you fit in in the world we're in today? <clears throat> so big picture, we have slowing growth. And it's going to be very hard to see where you're going to get uh, big uh, over two and a half percent growth rates. And uh, that means we're basically at a stall speed in a lot of the economy around the world. So as you can see from the map here, we don't have a lot of high growth areas around the world. The U.S. actually looks pretty good with their growth rate at around two and change, two and a half. Um, but we are going to struggle for growth around the world. <clears throat> Add to that, then now we have inflation coming down, which is helping. Uh, but uh, this is core, but I'm worried about headline inflation mm -hmm. <clears throat> starting to pick up again. But I think the real worry isn't where inflation is, because that's a, a point in time number. The real issue for the world, <clears throat> excuse me is the cost of living going up. And this is why populations are so out of sorts right now is they're seeing basically a 20% increase in the, in the basket of goods they use every day. And it's coming down, but it's coming down so slowly that it's creating big distortions between the haves and have nots. So today I wanna to answer <clears throat> or try and put some framework around three questions and provide answers to why are the central banks in the market so out of whack? Why has the consumer been so strong, which has been a surprise to many? And where to invest today, given all the uncertainty? Start with the markets okay. and the central banks have been out of whack for some time. And I think they're going to stay out of whack because one is working on hope and the other is working on fear. Yeah. The central bank fears being wrong and being wrong where they can't fix, the, get back to where they need to to get the economy back on track because they've used a lot of bullets over the last decade or so. The markets just want rates to get to a level that they can see better returns from. So there's an underlying disconnect from the start. I think the other issue, <clears throat> and this is really one that the markets focused on inflation where the Fed has to deal with cost of living, and that's what's gonna drive the economy forward. The market is less concerned about the employment number where the Fed really is concerned about employment. And I think the other alignment is the markets focused on the short-term returns the Fed is focused on getting sustainable growth, and those are not aligned right now. So when we think about the market's been out of step with the Fed for quite some time, this chart just shows you the probabilities. And to give you a sense, <clears throat> right now we have almost an 80% probability of rate cuts in March. And I don't see that coming. Personally, I think the uh, market's too aggressive on that. I think that's hope. But this is going out from August forward. Uh, into end of 20, June of 24, and you can just see the lack of alignment between the Fed and the markets. Ironically, I think the market's going to be right on Europe because Europe's slowing so much. I think the ECB will be aggressive on rate cuts, but I think you have to watch 
listening, who you're listening to, because when it comes to the central banks, you really need to listen to the, the two main players, which are uh, Lagarde and Powell. The other people are helping them by giving mixed messages, which lets them keep the market off balance. So I think the I think you really have to listen to the central bankers. They're they're often wrong too, but they're more right. They're less wrong than the market is. Let me put it that way. So I think you can expect rate cuts sometime next year, but not as quickly in the U.S. as the markets would like. I think you'll see them sooner out of Europe because I think Europe's economy is slowing at a much faster rate. But I think the challenges of Europe are much greater. But I think your the U.S. economy is still strong enough that rate cuts will be not as effective as they need to be. So let's switch gears to the consumer for a minute. And why is the consumer so strong? It starts with their rising net worth. And I've showed this chart a lot lately, but it's really telling when you go to uh, where we were in 08, <clears throat> and you can see we're about $65 trillion of net worth in the US, moving up from 08 to now to almost 100, it's over now 150, the latest number I think is 154 trillion. So that's part of the reason why the consumer has been so strong. But there is a problem with that number in that it's not even as we know, inequality is big. And what's driving it right now isn't the, the poor end of the economy. The bottom 40% basically spend everything they have. So they're pretty much a constant in the economy and they have gotten some push uh, up in their wealth, whether if you're retired on social security, you got an 11% increase. You have cost of living increases coming through for Social Security next year again. That's helping ease some of the pressures on that group. So the bottom end spends basically everything they have. It really comes down to what do the boomers and the silent generation do? And the boomers are retiring now, but they have massive capital and they're not slowing down their spending. And that's actually part of what's driving the economy forward because they own so much of the wealth that it's really how they go, well, how the U.S. economy goes. So I think that's one element. You have a, a big boomer market with big spend and less needs because they own their homes outright. I think 40% of them will own of people over 65 in the US own their homes outright right now, which means you're gonna get, uh, they don't have the same demands and interest rates are not the same pull on them. So I think that's another part that's uh, surprisingly strong in driving the economy. The second part is we're at record levels of employment. And when you look at this chart and go back to pre-pandemic, we're 6 million uh, jobs over the pre-pandemic level. So that's a big number when you think we're about 160 to 170 uh, is what our average uh, employment levels are in the market. We're moving back to those levels of uh, what the available uh, workers are. So we are at pretty full employment. And that has been a surprise given all the challenges that we've had. And you can see the converse of it is how lower an unemployment rate is, even down to the depths of where we were in the pandemic. So that's a big driver for the economy is uh, we do have a lot of employment and you do have big wage gains. 10% of the population or of the workforce is union and there you know the wage gains they have. As a result, the private sector is uh, in the non-union area is starting to match those wage gains. So when you combine those two with the stimulus that's come into the system and the fact that consumer net worth is so high, that's part of the reason why the consumer is so strong. A couple other reasons that we do have a lot of debt and this chart shows you how the debt is uh, composed. And as you can see, uh, mortgages make up the bulk of that, that's 70%. Uh, auto loans are about nine and student debt is about nine. And as you know, the student debt relief is going on right now, so that's eased some of the pressures as well. But the consumer is, is stronger in, in large part because since 08, we've done a lot to get our debt servicing costs down. And when you think about it, if we're about $16 trillion of, uh, of disposable income in the US, a 3% change on that is about uh, $500 billion of additional money into the consumer's pockets that was going to interest servicing that's now not that's now available for them to spend. So I think that's another key element to keep in mind. They've strengthened their balance sheets coming out of the great financial crisis. And that's reflected in the delinquencies on, uh, as you can see from delinqu delinquency status over different time periods, looking at where we were in 2010 versus where we are today, a very different picture. So I think that's just something to keep in mind. And then another look at that 
is foreclosures and bankruptcies, which we know going into from 03 on, you had bankruptcies on the rise and then foreclosures took off into the great financial crisis and have come down quite a bit. They are starting to peak, starting to drift back up a little bit. That's something we have to keep an eye on and watch that trend. The other big area, and this is a concern as we head into 24, <clears throat> is the fact that excess savings are being spent down. And you can see that they've come down quite a bit and even back to pre-pandemic levels. So a lot of the money that's been thrown to support the system is gone now. Now we're into the heavy lifting. And I think that's really one of the challenges as we head into next year. So where are we putting money to work today? We're primarily US oriented, so I'll start there. We love the FANGs and the semis in the tech area. We have long been focused on national security and we think about that in the industrial space from the defense companies, we're probably double, uh, we're actually uh, equal the weight of the total industrial sector weighting for the S&P just in defense companies. And then we are double the industrial weighting in most of our portfolios with the other industrial uh, 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 investment opportunities that we're taking advantage of. We think the materials area is gonna be essential for national security as well as the clean energy transition. Uh, so that's a big driver of our portfolios. And I think we're closing in on 15 to 20% weightings there in our portfolios. And there's some new rules coming out in the US uh, that we're starting to see on batteries where they're gonna look in 24, in 26, I believe, they're looking at where the sourcing of all the battery inputs are coming from. And that's gonna have a big change and could create a further digital divide and global divide around the world. Um, we still like the, reno the energy area, both fossils and renewables. We think they're both gonna be opportunities. You just have to size them particularly uh, carefully. And then healthcare, quality dividends and short-term cash and bonds are the areas we're really focused on. We are a little concerned about the consumer, the strength we think is gonna start to dissipate. We think those companies are gonna be under some more pressure and there's been a big move up in uh, the prices that were being charged. And I think a lot of the companies are gonna to have to pull back their pricing down. Uh, there's articles out in the last two days suggesting that inflation was primarily driven by corporates, corporations increasing their pricing and now they're gonna to have to bring that back down. That's gonna create a more of a divide in the corporate sector. We're still a little uneasy on banks, although I think you have to be very selective if you're gonna go there make sure you understand their liabilities. We don't think you have a very good transparency into bank liabilities. So uh, I'd be careful there, even though there could be some good opportunities and people are hide, hide, uh, hyping up that area now, we're a little more cautious. I think the debt loads are gonna be the determining factor for a lot of companies. Highly indebted low growth companies are gonna get slaughtered in the coming years. In our view, they're gonna to continue to get slaughtered. They've been hurt now, they're gonna get hurt worse. And then we're not, uh, very positive on the duration of long duration bonds as well. So that's where we're, we're, we're focused. I would say the big picture for us is we think the Fed is uh, closer to finishing rate hikes, but not going to lower them very much. We think the market's expectations for lowering of rates by the Fed would be tied into something really bad happening, not normal course of business. So in our view, either the market's expecting a lot of big problems around the world or they're out of step with where we think the Fed's actually gonna be. We don't think the Fed's gonna move up or down too much at all uh, in just normal economic activity. We think geopolitics or national politics could change that. Uh, we also think that China is getting closer to bottoming. They're not there yet, but if China bottoms and the US is closer to uh, where we are in uh, peak rates, we think that leads the way for a better uh, equity markets for next year in the global economy and more stability in the global economy as well. Um, so when we think about what's going on in the world, we're, we're, we're seeing it, keep an eye on the rising cost of living, not inflation, because inflation is going to send some false signals. Uh, if costs are high, consumers are going to pull back, and that's going to be a, a part of it. We think the global fragmentation is getting worse, and we think it's going to be further exacerbated by the elections coming up and also by the domestic policies that people are going to use to deal with the reindustrialization and their competitiveness. And I think this is one of the big issues for Europe as we see into next year. What is there going to be their industrial policies that give them the competitiveness and protect their competitiveness at a time they're really stretched? I also think this is a really time to be careful. I was quite positive uh, the last two months because we went from extremely oversold 
conditions to that. We've been overbought in a one month period. We had massive moves in the equity markets and in the bond markets uh, last month. And we think we need to take a little bit of a breather there. I think you have to keep in mind the climate there are two of the most powerful stimulants we've seen for some time, but there's gonna be a lot of money lost in both of those areas, as well as big money made, because we're early in that and we're in that stage where there's a lot of experimentation uh, and a lot of challenges. So given that we think there's gonna be financial stresses around the world, the consumer is gonna be under some pressure as well. We think you wanna follow the money and that's where the government and private sector are investing. They have clearly defined opportunities for you to follow. And we think that's gonna be uh, the big opportunities. And Mark, as always, we're fascinated by the innovation that's going on. And if anyone attended the conference last week in New York, they'll know the future is so amazing with the new innovations coming that there are big opportunities but this is very much a stock picker's market and one to not get too far or too clever with what you think the central banks are going to do uh, and follow the following all the talking heads, because I think we're going to be pretty far off from what actually happens in how central bank policy works versus where the markets are focused. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Stephen. I feel like I go to school every week. Hey, Stephen. Yes. Can you parse cost of living versus inflation? Yeah, cost of living. <clears throat> if I go to the if I go to the supermarket this year, and I go in ten years, the price change is cost of living. Inflation is a year to year is a point over time price change. So, you know, auto uh, used car prices are coming down, and they've come down a lot the last six months. But if you went to buy a used car four years ago or buying it today. That's the cost of living increase that you're dealing with. It's real and it's much higher than it was, but inflation would tell you that that number is coming down when you're paying more for the cars. That's the difference. So for us, it's what you eat and live with and, and run your house on. That's cost of living, right? All the stuff that you, in the supermarket is up and it stays up. Uh, inflation can move around every time you do the calculation. So that's how we look at the difference there. And that's confused a lot, but, People live off of cost of living. They don't live off of inflation. Well, there, thank you. I think, Adam, you had a question? Yes, yeah, Stephen, thank you for the presentation. My question to you is, earlier you said something about um, a, it seemed to suggest that the central bank or the Federal Reserve does not believe we, the current economy is sustainable. Current growth is sustainable. No, the, no, the, Do I understand the, that correctly? No, no, I, I'm, I probably missaid it. What I wanted to say was the, the role of a central bank is to is really in most countries is price stability first and foremost. But to maintain price stability, you have to get a sustainable level of growth above the rate of your debt and your costs. Okay. So they need to get their economies on path to on a glide path to more sustainable growth that is not the whipsaw that we've been going through for some time. Mm -hmm. And they're not there yet with their actions. And if they if they tighten too much, they're not going to get there. And if they ease too fast, you get the excesses brought back into the system, which will not allow you to get to the sustainable growth that you need. So part of the problem we've had the last several years is we've had these dramatic price swings that make it hard to plan going forward, whether you're a government or a business or a household, right? So what they need to do is get things to be less volatile. And that means you have to have policies that are not swinging around all the time so you can invest appropriately and manage your returns that way. But governments need to get really to get to a much better, uh, more normal level of growth to where you can see consistency in that number. That's what the central banks need so that they can control inflation and have full employment be there with more, more normal swings. We've had really aggressive swings in the numbers. And I, I could just pull up any one of the charts and would show you that you know inflation numbers, that's not how it looked in the past. They've been more steady state and that growth has been more steady state. We've had these whipsaws for the last 15 years that we have to, we're not there yet. And they need better growth numbers from around the world. But is that volatility not more a function of extraordinary events like the pandemic and in the the financial crisis in 2008 it, or is it, it it's the it's that plus the reaction to those things 
And that's okay. actually part of where the market gets screwed up is you know, when we talk about the disconnect between the market and the Fed, they want the market to act on their behalf. They want the Fed to act on the market's behalf when the Fed's job is to act on the nation's behalf, right? Which is full employment and price stability, not pushing up asset prices okay. and asset values. So there's a disconnect of what the market wants and what the Fed's job is. And same with central banks around the world. Yep. Their job isn't to boost the uh, the markets. Their job is to get the economy to be have inflation stabilized, fuller employment, and more stable growth. That's really the job yep. of every single bank. Thank you, Stephen. Michael Hammer. But you touched on volatility, and that makes me think of the VIX. And I'm amazed at how low it is given the risk of downside surprises compared to upside surprises. Any comments? Agreed. I, I touched on this last week when I showed the chart of the VIX around 14 at that point and all the problems in the world, all the risks of the world, and we're at a, a near a near lowest, uh, historically low levels. Makes no sense to me. A part of that, though, is, and it's beginning getting more press, is the... Uh, the amount of algorithmic trading actually does create, and indexing does create a level of stabilization that's unusual because you would think it'd create more volatility, but when you have so much money doing the same thing, it, it for most of the time, it creates a little bit more stability and then, then all of a sudden it breaks. And that's actually part of the challenge we're dealing with right now. So I'm shocked that the levels are where they are. It makes no sense. Anyone else? Get all figured out, guys. Actually, I apologize. This was a tough one for me to get done. As Mark knows, he was looking for the presentation. Uh, um, Asher's, yeah, Asher's, Asher's coming on. He, he, I feel a question from him. And then, you know what? You haven't done it, Asher. Do you mind at least introducing yourself to everyone? Because it's been a while. Hi, my name is Asher Sneaky. It's it's been a while. I, I'm I'm sorry, guys. I I used to be here, a uh, regular a couple of years ago. Um, I I live in Dubai. I'm between Dubai and and the Bay Area. I'm I'm in venture. Hey, good good to meet you all. Good to see you again. Other question? I'm like we we just went through this. Like, what scares you? Excites you? Uh, by the way, we have a twist on the uh, fun fact game. That we do at lunches. This is this is uh, thanks to a woman named Zena uh, Bella, who uh, runs a five hundred million dollar health health related fund out of London. Is that we put our fun facts into we write them down separately, put them into a basket, and then you you we went around and we drew last night last night, and you had to guess who at the table was associated with the fun fact. So, for example, someone who is who uh, is a uh, self-described uh, older person who loves Taylor Swift, and it went six people at a ten-person table to try to find that person. And he runs the foundation of the Cleveland Clinic. It was a man, not a woman, but it was in. Anyways, we we uh, it's been interesting. The, the other the other takeaways on the scares and excites. Um, I mentioned China changes earlier. Um, yeah, everyone's sort of worried about that third or fourth or fifth war that could that could come up. Um, you know, we were supposed to have Henry Kissinger, right? That that was, you know, and we had a tribute to him. Um, you know, another, I guess, factor. No one's on. It's it's well after midnight here. So I'm the only one left from the uh Singapore crowd. But the other I guess the other factor that was uh, it, AI and guardrails. The the CEO of uh, General Catalyst was was there. If anybody knows knows him, and so he had three themes. We ha how you're dealing with supply chain ripples, the, the all those changes. I don't think that that, that they've been felt yet. Uh, responsible innovation to think about because you have to, including AI and the guardrails uh, was a big theme longevity but yet how how do our health systems the cost of health health care is just it's only going to rise save your possibly technology 
So anyway, that's some of the themes that we just echoing a bit, I guess a bit from here. Other comments, what scares and excites us broadly? So I have a question. You sound a little muted to me at least. Uh, um, there you go. Okay. Um, oh, oh, the Columbus, Ohio. Chris, uh, Michael Red. Anybody know Michael Red from the Milwaukee Bucks? I see we from from Ohio. I just makes sure, makes me. He's investing in venture. You need, you need to meet him, Michael. An introduction. I'll, I'll I'll do it right after this call. Okay. Uh, you need to come. Play Steve, he'll be there. Go ahead. Um, I put a link into the chat an article about landlords of office towers um, walking away, handing in the keys uh, to the mortgage holders. And I was having a discussion and maybe you have a data point. How much, do you have any sense of how much of that debt is held by banks and how much of it is in like CDOs or CMOs? I don't, so, I'm, I'm not current on where, where all that money's shipped around to, so. Uh, I'm not sure who's who's holding the bag, which is your real, your real question, right? That's really what I was asking. But yeah, I, but I bet I bet Anna Arsov would know who will be in Florida because she's she's head of credit for Moody's, and she's going to give you a nuanced answer. But you have you have to play pickleball. You have to come down to Florida, to join. Walter, we'll get a cake for your yeah. wife too. Yeah, yeah, Stephen. A quick question for you in terms of. Um oil production in general. I've seen that the Saudis are cutting back on, on their production of oil by another million barrels a day, approximately. We've had some pretty stable oil prices recently. Um, the war uh, that's taking place in the Middle East, um, you know, the Russian thing, where do you see oil prices going and how do you, how do you account for that? Uh, I, I think they're gonna go higher. Uh, not, I don't know how much, but I think the Saudis and others really want eighty dollars a barrel at, at least. Um, I think they're going to get it. I think that'll take them some time. I think there's going to be a lot of cheating going on because a lot of people can't afford to do the cuts for their for their own budgets. But you know, it's it's one of those challenges for all these uh, producers is how much do you cut to how much do you cut to do the math to get your prices to, to get to the revenues you need to get to. I think that's really what they're focused on. Um, so I would suspect, I, I think they're biased higher and I think the supply and demand is gonna push it up over time. I think we're in one of those periods where there's so much negativity that um, people are more feared about slowing economy than they are about a 2% growth economy. And I think we'll probably be 3% next year and we'll probably need more oil. So I think the bias is up on that. Thank you. Other comments, questions? And Walter, we're long, we're long uh, a couple of the oil names and we're also long some of the renewables names. I think you have to play both sides of it because I think both sides could win. Others? Steven, I, I've got a question regarding the uh, the growing net worth of the American a consumer so that's 16 trillion in disposable income who has that 16 trillion in disposable income are these the boomers or it's it's all over but it's it's weighed very heavily to the uh boomers and i don't uh yeah i don't have disposable income i just have net worth for them so i'd have to get that chart broken down okay um, i thought you, i thought you had mentioned uh 16 no, trillion I, yeah, I did. I did mention 16 trillion. And what I said on that was uh, uh, because of the, the uh, debt servicing costs as a percent of that was at 13, it's come down to about 3%. The equivalent of that would be about $500 million and they would be able to, uh, that's cash back into their pocket instead of debt servicing costs, money in their pocket. And I think that's, that's a big number for people who are benefiting from that. Okay. Um, that's helped the household balance sheets considerably. It, it doesn't save them. And, you know, you have to keep in mind on all these things, they're aggregated numbers and the 
I think the real problem underneath it is the haves and have nots issue is going to be with us for a long, long time. And with That's AI, I think it's going to get worse. And I think we're going to end up at some point really taking hard looks at uh, guaranteed income schemes. Well, we know one of those trillion is sitting right here in Seattle in the hands of about four or five people. <laughs> well, one of them's moved to Miami. Well, which one? There's so many that moved to Miami. Bezos. Bezos. Uh, to Miami. Other, other com comment? Sorry, Austin. Yeah, that you mentioned investment in fossil fuels. I just would like to get your perspective on future CO2 emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, where you see that headed. I don't think we're doing a great job bringing them down. <laughs> so I think uh, we're just the evidence suggests we're doing no good job at all at bringing them down. But yeah, it, I, it, actually, that was not the theme of the Singapore conference. I have to, and I, and I don't have that recording. There's a there's a sense of actually we we're conquering cancer, in, within the next five seven years, um, and that the there's been a shift and it may not be, I and I need to like source it all and and you know it was not my these are not my panels but it's an interesting dichotomy people who were at COP and then came over to Singapore and some back vice vice versa. But the, 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 again, I guess he's like the chair of uh, UCLA's business school was debating it. So it's not clear that there, there, there's an open debate. And it wasn't like a political debate. It was a, it, it, I think it's more like the technologists who are very bullish. They can't help themselves. And they're, and they're versus, you know, some other camps. So I park, park that. But yeah, I, 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 I hear you. Sure. I would My say, Mark, is just. As a party, one, I would just say that I think that what gets lost is the is the uh, law of large numbers. When the U.S., China, and the big nations are way behind, it masks this good stuff that's being done by a lot of other nations too. And I think that's part of the challenge. Is there is a lot of good stuff. It's just not not enough, and not from the biggest players yet.